and execute judgment and justice. Take away your exactions from my people, saith the Lord God. You shall have just balances and a just ephah and a just bath. The ephah and the bath shall be of one measure, that, that the bath may contain the tenth part of an homer, and the ephah the tenth part of an homer. The measure thereof shall be after the homer. And the shekel shall be twenty gears, twenty shekels, five and twenty shekels, fifteen shekels shall be your mani. This is the oblation that ye shall offer. The sixth part of an ephah of an homer of wheat, and ye shall give the sixth part of an ephah of an homer of barley. Concerning the ordinance of oil, the bath of oil, ye shall offer the tenth part of a bath out of the core, which is an homer of ten baths, for ten baths are an homer. And one lamb out of the flock out of two hundred, out of the fat pastures of Israel, for a meat offering and for a burnt offering and for peace offerings, to make reconciliation for them, saith Lord God. All the people of the land shall give this oblation for the prince in Israel. And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feasts and in the new moons and in the Sabbaths and all solemnities of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. Thus saith Lord God, in the first month, in the first day of the month, thou shalt take a young bullock without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering and put it upon the post of the house and upon the four corners of the settle of the settle of the altar and upon the post of the gate of the inner court. And so thou shalt do the seventh day of the month for every one that earth and for him that is simple. So shall ye reconcile the house. In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month, ye shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. And upon that day shall the prince prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bullock for a sin offering. And seven days of the feast he shall prepare a burnt offering to the Lord, seven bullocks and seven rams without blemish, daily the seven days, and a kid of the goats daily for a sin offering. And he shall prepare a meat offering of an ephah for a bullock, and an ephah for a ram, and a, hen, and a hen of oil for an ephah. In the seventh month, in the fifteenth day of the month, shall he do the like in the feast of the seven days, according to the sin offering, according to the burnt offering, and according to the meat offering, and according to the oil. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for our church. And for the book of Ezekiel, God, I ask that you meet with us tonight, be with our hearts, God, and I ask you please be with our pastor, God, strength, Lord, and fill the spirit, God, I love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, well, we're there in Ezekiel 45, and we took a uh, couple of weeks uh, break from the book of Ezekiel, of course, when Brother Stuckey was here and uh, preaching for us on Wednesday night, and we are back in Ezekiel. We're almost done. There's 48 chapters, and we find ourselves in chapter 45 tonight. And if you remember, we are in this last section of the book of Ezekiel, uh, which is known as Ezekiel's temple uh, or Ezekiel's end times prophecy, even though Ezekiel covers end times prophecy throughout the book. In chapters 40 through 48, it's specifically having to do with end times and uh, the temple. And if you remember, uh, when we have been in the book of Ezekiel, the last four weeks we've been uh, talking about these theories uh, in regards to uh, the temple, and we've been kind of talking about them and dismantling them, and we'll review that later on tonight, but we've been going through and showing you why uh, we don't necessarily believe those theories or the problems with those theories. Tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, give you my theory in regards to what I believe is happening here in the book of Ezekiel. So we're going to start off by, like we've been doing, uh, just give you a real quick basic outline of the chapter, just so you can have an idea of what's going on in the chapter itself. And then we're going to spend the majority of our night talking about uh, Ezekiel's temple and the end times prophecy explained or explained to you my position or my theory on that. So what I want to do is begin by just giving you this basic outline. We'll do it super fast because there's a lot to cover in regards to uh, the theory tonight. But um, if, you, if you want to take notes or if you've been taking notes in regards to these chapters, let me give you uh, the outline. There's two major sections to uh, this chapter. The first is the land for the priest. So if you're writing an outline, you could write a number one or a letter A, the land for the priest. And you find that there was a portion that was given to the Levites in verses one through five. You'll notice there in verse one, it says, moreover, when ye shall divide by lot the land. So I want you to notice that the emphasis is on the land and the land has to be divided for inheritance, ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord, an holy portion of the land. And he talks about the length, and he talks about the breadth. Notice verse 2, of this there shall be for the sanctuary. So he's saying that this land is set aside for the sanctuary. Again, he talks about the length, he talks about the breadth. Notice verse 4, the holy portion of the land shall be for the priest. 
So he says this is for the sanctuary, this is for the priest. Notice the last part of verse 4, a place for their houses and a holy place for the sanctuary. So he, he talks about the fact that the land has to be divided, but there has to be a portion of the land that is set aside for the priests, for their houses, for their families to live in, and then for the sanctuary or the temple itself. In verse 6, we see a portion for the house of Israel. So we've got the portion for the land. Then we have the portion for the house of Israel. Notice uh, it, it, ta- it gives the word for how broad it should be, how long it should be. Notice the last part of verse 6. It says, for the whole house of Israel. And he gives that length. Then in verses 7 through 8, he talks about a portion for the prince. So there's a portion for the priest, a portion for the people, and then there's a portion for the prince, verse 7, and a portion shall be for the prince. He gives the length, he gives the size. Notice verse 8, In the land shall be his possession in Israel, and my princes shall no more oppress my uh, people. So then we come into the second section of this chapter, which is the offerings of the temple priest. So the first section has to do with the land. We talked about a land for the priest, a land for the people, a land for the prince. And then he talks about an offering for the temple. And he goes into this detail about these offerings. So the first thing he ta- does in verses 9 through 12 is he calls for justice and fairness. He talks about the fact that this land needs to be a land where justice abound. Notice verse 9. Thus saith the Lord God, let it suffice you, O princes of Israel. He says, remove violence and spoil and execute judgment and justice. Take away your exactions from my people. Notice verse 10. Ye shall have just balances and a just ephah and a just bath. Notice verse 11. And uh, the ephah and the bath shall be of one measure. Then in verses 13 through 17, and I'm going through this quickly because I've got a lot of other things I'd like to cover tonight. In verses 13 through 17, he talks about the offering of the priest. And notice verse 13, this is the oblation that ye shall offer. And he gives an explanation there. Notice verse 16, all the people of the land shall give this oblation for the priest. Notice verse 17, and it shall be the prince's part to give. So basically, they give to the people, the people give to the prince, and then the prince has a duty to give uh, on behalf of the people. Then in verses 18 through 20, it explains the atonement for sin done in ignorance. And if you remember our study in Leviticus, if you're with us, God differentiates between sins that are done in ignorance or sins that are done on purpose. And of course, you're still responsible and accountable, but he does di- differentiate. And in verse 18, if you look at the last part of the verse, it says, talks about uh, uh, cleanse the sanctuary. So you, of course, have to prepare the sanctuary. Then in verse 20, if you look at the last part or the middle part, it says, for him that is simple, so shall ye reconcile the house. So for him, that is simple, meaning for someone who sinned and they We're not aware what they were doing. They were simple in regards to that. Then in verses 21 through 25, he talks about the Passover offering. Uh, So notice verse uh, 22. It says, And upon that day shall the prince prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bullock for a sin offering. It talks about this offering, verse 24, and he shall prepare a meat offering. And it goes on to explain these Offerings, we of course read the entire chapter uh, before we started. So that's just a rough outline of what's happening in this chapter. And it's again just very similar to the other chapters when it talks about the different offerings that are being done. And it's just explaining this time that Ezekiel is talking about. Now, if, if you remember, and this is where I want to spend the majority of, of my sermon tonight, and I'd like you to keep your place there in Ezekiel. That's our text for tonight. But go with me to the book of Isaiah. If you go backwards, you're going to go past. Uh, Lamentations, Jeremiah, into the book of Isaiah. And let me kind of just give a quick introduction or or setup for uh, tonight. As far as I can tell in the research that I've done, there seems to be four major themes. We've talked about them. I know you're familiar with them. But there seems to be four major uh, theories in regards to what is happening. Because Ezekiel 40 through 48 may be... Uh, the uh, most difficult chapters in the Bible, and there's a lot of debate in regards to what is going on here, because we have Ezekiel explaining uh, a time that nobody's been able to identify, a temple that no one's ever seen, and things that are happening, and there are four major theories that people have came up with in regards to answer what is happening in these chapters, 40 through 48. I gave you all four, I'll, I'll, I'll review them real quickly. One is that the temple is symbolic, 
that it's not literal, that it's not to be taken literally, that it's all symbolism. And we uh, went through and talked about that in chapter 41 and kind of dismantled that. And I gave you my reasons why I don't believe that this is symbolic. I believe that this is a real temple uh, that's, uh, that was to be taken literally. And if you missed that sermon, you can go back and review that. Then uh, we talked about the fact that there's a theory that says that this is Ezra and Zerubbabel's temple. That Ezekiel is in captivity, and once the captivity was done, once the 70-year captivity was over, the children of Israel went back to their land. Cyrus released them. They went back to the land. Of course, that's when Nehemiah built the wall around Jerusalem. Ezra, Zerubbabel, those guys rebuilt the temple. And they'll say, well, this is the prophecy of that temple. That temple was fulfilled through Ezra and Zerubbabel. In chapter 42, I took time to kind of go through and dismantle that, explain why uh, that doesn't make sense and why it doesn't match up and why we don't accept that theory. Then there is the theory that this is the temple of the eternal state meaning it's, not, uh, it's what we would call heaven or new Jerusalem. It's after the millennial reign, and uh, it's, it's this heavenly temple. And in chapter 43, we went through and explained why that cannot be the case, and we showed that uh, from, uh, from the Bible. And then the last time that we were together in the book of Ezekiel, uh, we dealt with the most popular theory, and definitely the most popular theory among Baptists, and it is that this is the millennial reign uh, temple, that this is a temple that will be built during the thousand-year reign of Christ. And, of course, uh, we explained how that cannot be the case uh, unless you're a dispensationalist, uh, because, and we're not, and there's lots of problems with dispensational theology, but, this, but in order to believe that, and dispensationalists accept it because they'll say, hey, you know what? The sacrifices are making a comeback, and uh, you know we're in the dispensation of grace, and today we get saved by grace, but during the millennial reign, they'll get saved uh, by works, and they'll get saved by keeping the sacrifices. And of course, we went through the book of Hebrews and dismantled that and showed how that cannot be the case. So, that leaves us with uh, my theory. <laughs> and um, before I give you my theory, and I realize I'm giving you a lot of introduction, but uh, just bear with me. I do need to give some credits and disclaimers, all right? Some credits and disclaimers in regards to my theory. First of all, let me say this. This is just my theory, all right? It's just a theory, and I'm not uh, dogmatic about it. Uh, so, you know, we don't really know. The Bible says that we see through a glass darkly. The Bible says that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And uh, so this is just my theory. Um, I believe this theory answers all of the questions that we have problems with in regards to the other theories. But I am open to uh, hearing other people's theories if anybody can come up with a better theory. I also want to say this, that as I've been studying the book of Ezekiel, and when I started preaching through the book of Ezekiel, however long ago that was, you know, 45 weeks ago plus, 45 plus weeks ago, uh, I knew that this passage was going to be the most difficult part to go through. So as I've been preaching through the book of Ezekiel, and even leading up to while we were still studying through 1 Corinthians before we got into Ezekiel, I was reading Ezekiel systematically, going through it over and over and over, and taking notes and writing notes. And as I traveled, and I tend to travel more than, I, than I'd like, as I've traveled and preached at different churches and conferences or whatever, whenever I got a chance to get around a pastor friend, I would always ask them for their thoughts on Ezekiel 40 and 48. Now, let me say this. It's not really fair to put somebody on the spot. What do you think about the most difficult passage in Ezekiel, you know, uh, over dinner after a conference or whatever? But I'd ask people, do you have any thoughts? I'm preaching through this or whatever. And people would give me their thoughts, and a lot of things were kind of general to what I've uh, uh, already knew or heard or the conclusions that I came to. But I do want to give credit where credit is due. And I will tell you that the theory that I'm giving you tonight was actually given to me by Pastor McMurtry. Pastor McMurtry was one person who kind of threw this theory out there. He said, well, you know, something I've thought about and something I think might be the case. And, and he threw that out there. And when he said that to me, it just it kind of made a lot of sense. And I, I thought, you know, I'd, I'd like to look into that. And as I began to think about it, and as I began to compare scripture, I thought, you know, I think he might be uh, on to something here. So I do want to give credit to Pastor McMurtry because he actually gave me uh, the, the seed thought uh, for this theory. That doesn't mean that everything I say tonight, uh, Pastor McMurtry agrees with. You know, I don't know. Maybe he does. I don't, I don't know. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't give me every single point that I'm going to make tonight. He just kind of gave me the thought and I've kind of ran with it. So uh, I, he, we were emailing back and forth this week, and I was, we were talking about this sermon, and he said he's going to listen to it and give me some feedback. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see what he thinks. But I do want to give credit to him that he was kind of the one that put this thought in my mind, and I'm kind of going with it and, and uh, running with it. But again, 
I want to give a disclaimer. That doesn't mean that he agrees with everything I'm going to say tonight. And, um, but I do want to say this. Pastor McMurtry gave me the idea. If I end up preaching just complete heresy tonight, you all know who to blame. And uh, you can send your emails to Pastor McMurtry. But um, here's the theory. Now, here's the thing. My theory is not complicated. And you're smart. You are a smart group. If you go to Verity Baptist Church, you're smart. Not because of me, but just because you've got to be smart to go to a church that emphasizes Scripture and things like this. This is not a complicated theory. I could give it to you in a couple of statements, and you would get it. But if I gave it to you in a couple of statements, it would not answer all of the questions that you may have. So what I want to do tonight is I want to give you statements, uh, several statements, many statements, and we're kind of going to just go line by line and build truth upon truth so that not only will you get the theory, but you will answer the questions that you may have after theory. And, of course, you may still have some questions afterwards, and that's fine. You can ask me uh, afterwards, and we can... I can try to answer that for you, or I may not have an answer for it. We can try to wrestle it down together. But I want to give you some thoughts to kind of build into why this theory makes sense and why this theory, in my opinion, is the best theory that I've, at least that I've ever heard, in regards to what is happening here in Ezekiel 40 through 48. All right? Are you there in Isaiah 46? So I, need, I, I'm kind of, I guess what I'm telling you is you got to put your thinking cap on tonight, all right? It's Bible study night, and it's Ezekiel. So just... Uh, Put your thinking cap on, and we will uh, walk through this. I'm going to give you statements. If you'd like to write these down, you're welcome to do so. I'm going to give you a lot, though, just as a warning. So I've kind of divided these statements into three sections, all right? And we'll kind of build through them as we go. The first thing is that I, the, 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 the first section is that there are some things that you need to know about God. Now, I know that you probably know this about God already, but I want to make sure we understand this. All of us understand this together about God. There are some things you need to know about God, Almighty God, Creator God, all right? Number one, just things you need to know about God to help you kind of understand this theory. God knows the end from the beginning. God knows everything. And the Bible says that He knows the end from the beginning. What that means, and let's look at the passage together. Isaiah 46, look at verse 9. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. The Bible says, remember the former things of old. So God is speaking here, and he says, I want you to remember the old things, the former things of old. He says, for I am God. He says, here's why I want you to remember the old things, because I am God. He says, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. That's a great verse. I love that verse there, Isaiah 46, 9. Look at verse 10. In verse 9, he just got done telling us, look, I'm God and there's nobody like me. I am God and there's nothing close to me. And then in verse 10, he says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. So I want you to notice that one thing that makes, and there's many things that makes God, God. But one thing that makes God different than you, the reason that God is God and you are not, is because God is infinite in knowledge. He's infinite in, 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 in His power. And the Bible tells us that God can declare the end from the beginning. Meaning, before something begins, He can already tell you how it's going to end. He says, from ancient times, I can tell you the things that are not yet done. So He says, things that have not yet happened, I can tell you those from ancient times, I can declare the end from the beginning. So there's a couple of things you need to know about God. Number one, God knows the end from the beginning. Number two, go to 1 Samuel 23. Uh, towards the uh, beginning of the Old Testament in comparison to Isaiah, you'll find all the one, two books. They're all clustered together. 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. Go to 1 Samuel 23 and then do me a favor and put a ribbon or a bookmark in 1 Samuel, because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it, and I'd like you to be able to get to it fairly quickly. 1 Samuel 23, I said number one, things that you need to know about God, God knows the end from the beginning. Number two, and I want you to understand this, God knows what would happen after any choice you happen to make in any given situation no matter what choice you end up making. I know that's a little wordy, but I want you to understand what I'm telling you. God knows if you find yourself in a situation and you've got several options, you've got option A, option B, option C, God knows what would happen 
if you were to choose any one of those options, no matter what choice you ended up making, God knows what would happen based on those decisions. You say, prove that to me from the Bible. Let me prove it to you. 1 Samuel 23, look at verse 7. And it was told Saul that David was come to Cala. Now, if you remember, David is running. He's an outlaw from Saul. He's running for his life. And he's hiding in this city, Cala. And Saul finds out about it. It was told Saul that David was come to Cala. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Cala to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring hither the ephod, all right? So David's in Cala, a walled city. Saul finds out that David's in Cala and says, God has delivered him into my hands. I'm going to go get him. He's trapped in this city. And David knows that uh, Saul has people that are going to report back to him and that Saul knows where David or that Saul potentially knows where David is. So David calls Abiathar the priest because he wants to ask God about it. Notice verse 10. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come. So he says, God, I've heard that Saul is seeking to come to Cala to destroy the city for my sake. And then he asks these questions. Notice the questions he asks. Verse 11. Will the men of Cala deliver me up into his hand? So he says, if Saul comes, if Saul comes, will the men of Cala deliver me up? Then he asks this question, will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? So he's, a, so he's asking several questions, saying, God, I need to know a couple things. Number one, is Saul even going to come? And number two, if Saul comes, will the men of Cala deliver me up? Are they going to give me up? Or will they fight for me? Will they defend me? He says, O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, notice the answer, because God can tell you the end from the beginning, because God can declare from ancient times the things that are not yet done. The Bible says, and the Lord said, he will come down. So here's the answer to the question. God tells David, if you stay, he'll come. Notice verse 12. Then, say, then said David, will the men of Caleb deliver me up and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you, they will deliver thee up. So again, he says, if you stay, he'll come. And if he comes, they will deliver you up. But notice what happens. Verse 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Cala and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Cala. Notice what it says at the end of verse 13. And he forbear to go forth, meaning Saul decided not to go. And you might look at that and say, well, that's a contradiction because God told him that he would come down. But here's what I want you to understand. David had several options. He had an option, I can stay or I can go. And he says, Lord, if I stay, what will happen? And God says, if you stay, Saul will come. And if Saul comes, they will deliver you up. So David decides to go. But notice, when David goes, Saul decides not to even come down. You say, is that a contradiction? No, I believe that God put that there in the Bible because God wanted to show us that based on our decisions, different choices may come based on those decisions. And God knows all of them. God knew what would happen if David would stay, and God knew what would happen if David would go. Now, David didn't ask that question, but if David would have asked, well, what would happen if I leave? God could have said, Saul won't come. Because here's what I want you to understand. God knows the end from the beginning, and God knows what would happen in any given situation where you've got different choices to make. He would know what would happen at the end of any one of those choices. Go to Psalm 90. Keep your place there in 1 Samuel 23. Go to the book of Psalm. You're there in 1 Samuel. You got 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm. Psalm 90. And here's the point that I'm trying to make. It's not, it's not that in life you've got, you know, you come to a situation where you've got to make a choice and you've got choice A, choice B, choice C, and God knows you're going to choose B, so he has a detailed plan at the end of B. It's not that. It's the fact that God has a detailed plan for any choice you might make. And whatever choice you end up making, he can tell you how that choice will end. 
My kids, you know, I wanted to use this as an illustration. My kids, I remember when I was a kid, I read a book like this, and my kids have read uh, several books like this. I, I think they're called uh, Choose Your Adventure, uh, but I know there's different kinds, and they might go by different names. But my kids have this, uh, have this, have this book, it's a series of books, where you read them, and you kind of track along with the main character, and at certain points in the book, the character has to make a decision. He has to make a decision whether he's going to do this, or he's going to do that, or he's going to do whatever. And then the reader actually gets to make the decision in the book, and the book is written to where it's, it tells you if you make this decision, go to this page. If you make this decision, go to this page. If you make this decision, go to this page. And the book is written in a way where there's a storyline and a, a plot and a storyline that continues on a different storyline for every decision you make. So you can read the same book several different times, making different decisions and seeing what happens to this character. So there's a storyline written for every choice that is made. What's, and, and that's kind of how it is in my life and in your life. In fact, the Bible says, are you there in Psalm 90, verse 9? The Bible says, for all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Your life is kind of, the Bible says that your life is written out like a tale that's already uh, happened. And God already knows what decisions you're going to make. But it's kind of like that book where you've got decision A, decision B, decision C. And God already has written out what would happen based on those decisions that uh, you make. So here's what you need to understand about God. And we're getting into a little bit of, uh, you know, theology of God. God knows the end from the beginning. God knows what would happen after any choice in any given situation that you happen to make, no matter what choice you make. Number three, God also knows what choice you will make. Does that make sense? Not only does he know what would happen in any choice you might make, he also knows which choice you will make. Psalm 139. You're there in Psalm 90? Flip over to Psalm 139. Look at verse 1. Psalm 139. Look at verse 1. Psalm 139. 1, the Bible says this, To the chief musician, a psalm of David. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Here, the Bible says, David is saying to God, God, you've searched me, you know me. Notice what he says there in verse 2. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest. Notice what it says. Thou understandest. God understands my thought afar off. What does that mean? It means that God knows my thoughts or my ideas when my thoughts and my ideas are far away from me. God knows my thoughts and my ideas before I've even had the thought or the idea. Notice verse 3. Thou compassest. That means to surround, to, to completely be around my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You know what ways I could go. You are acquainted with all of them. Verse 4. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. God knows what you're going to say before you say it. Notice verse 5. Thou hast beset me. That means you've surrounded or you've completely covered me behind and before. God, when you leave, God was there. When you get there, God, was, God is there. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. And here's what I want you to understand, and here's what I'd like you to go. And I need you to go to Deuteronomy, because we're, and we're going to look at a lot of passages tonight, so I'm trying to kind of keep you moving. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I, I know you kept your place in, in uh, Ezekiel, and I think I asked you to keep your place in 1 Samuel, but I also need you to keep your place in Deuteronomy, okay? We're going to leave it, and we're going to come back to it. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And let me just say this, okay? Let me, I, I want to make sure you're understanding what I'm telling you tonight. God knows the end from the beginning. Not only does, meaning he knows how the story is going to play out. God also knows how the story could play out if you were to make different choices. God knows what would happen in any given situation if you were to make any given choice, no matter what choice you make. God also knows what choice you're going to make. So when you get to a situation where you've got to make a choice and you've got A, B, or C, God knows what would happen if you chose A. God knows what would happen if you chose B. God knows what would happen if you chose C. And God knows which one you're going to choose. Now, this is important, all right? Although God knows what choice you will make, 
That does not mean that God made the choice for you. We are not Calvinists. God gives you the free will to make your own choice. God knows what choices you could make. God knows what would happen based on whatever choice you decide to make. And God knows what choice you're going to make. But that doesn't mean that God made the choice for you. So here's point number four. Although God knows what choice you will make, God gives you the free will to make your own choice. Just because God knows what choice you will make does not mean that God made the choice. Now, we can go to a lot of different passages for this. I'm just going to give you one. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Here's what the Bible says. God says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Notice what he's telling the children of Israel. He says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Notice that God's not making the choice for them. He said, you've got choice A, you've got choice B. I know what will happen if you choose A. I know what will happen if you choose B. I know what choice you're going to make, but I'm not making the choice for you. I am pleading with you to choose life. He says, therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So I want, you to, I want to make sure you understand, we are not Calvinists. Although God knows what choice you will make, God gives you the free will to make your own choice. Just because God knows what choice you will make does not mean that God is making the choice on your behalf. Go back to 2 Samuel, if you kept your place there. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Just because God knows what choice you will make, that does not mean that God chooses for you. That's statement number five, if you'd like to write that down. Just because God knows what choice you will make, that does not mean that God chooses for you. Here's statement number six. Since you get to make your own choice, God has an ending plan for every choice you make. And I know we've already kind of covered that, but I just want to make sure you understand that. Since God does not choose for you, he has written out a story for every choice. And you get to make the choice, and he knows what would happen, and he knows what choice you'll make. But just because... Uh, you, you get to make your own choice because there is a such thing as free will. God has an ending plan for every choice you may make. 2 Samuel 12, look at verse 7. Here, of course, we've got the famous story of David committing adultery with Bathsheba. This is the aftermath when Nathan the prophet comes to him. I want you to notice what Nathan says to David. 2 Samuel 12, 7, the Bible says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, notice what he says, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Now, we don't know what those such and such things are, but we know this, that when David got to the place where he had to make a choice whether he was going to commit adultery with Bathsheba or whether he was going to forbear from committing adultery with Bathsheba. God already knew what would happen if David went down this road. God already knew what would happen if David went down that road. You say, well, how do you know that? Because here God, Nathan is telling uh, David that if you would have not done this, God had more things for you, such and such things. But now those things are off the table because you made this choice, David. But God knew what would happen if you made this choice. God knew what would happen if you made that choice. And God also knew what choice David was going to make. So since you get to make your own choices, God has an ending plan for every choice that you make. And the sad thing is this. Let me just give you a quick, uh, you know, preaching application. If you can go to Numbers 18 from Deuteronomy, just go backwards to number. Let me say this. You know, it'll be sad to get to the end of our lives, to get to heaven one day and realize that there were such and such things that God had planned for us that we missed out on based on the choices we made. So remember, I've got three sections. I need you to just kind of follow with me and track with me in regards to theology, all right? The first one is this, things you need to know about God. What do you need to know about God? You need to know that God knows the end from the beginning. You need to know that God knows what would happen after any choice you happen to make in any given situation, no matter what choice you end up making. God also knows what choice you will make. Although God knows what choice you will make, God gives you the free will to make your own choice. 
Uh, just because God knows what choice you will make, that does not mean that God chooses for you. And since you get to make your own choice, God has an ending plan for every choice that you make. All right? You need to know that about God. Number two, <laughs> things you need to know about the covenants. Because we're talking about the covenants, right? The Old Covenant, the New Covenant. The Old Testament, the New Testament. Maybe you can write these down. Number one, the Old Covenant was meant to carry the children of Israel through the end of time or through what we call the end times. The Old Covenant, when it was given, was meant to carry the children of Israel through the end of time or through end times. Are you there in Numbers 18? Look at verse number 19. Numbers 18, verse 19. All the heave offerings. Now, we're in the book of Numbers, so we know we're in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, of course. But we're even in verses that are specifically applied to the Old Covenant. An heave offering is Old Covenant, right? All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee. Notice what he says, by a statute forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. So I want you to notice that in Deuteronomy 18, 19, we're told that these certain offerings that the children of Israel were doing, God said, hey, I'm giving you this covenant forever. This covenant will carry you forever, or it has the potential to carry you forever, or it can take you unto the end of times, or it can take you into the end times. Go to Numbers 25. Numbers 25, look at verse 11. Numbers 25 and verse 11. You're there in Numbers 18, just flip a few pages over. Numbers 25 and verse 11, the Bible says this, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest. All right, so we're in the Old Covenant, right? Old Testament. We've got the Levitical priest. He's the son of Aaron. Hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel when he was zealous for my sake among them that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, behold... I give unto him my covenant of peace. He's talking about Phineas, a Levitical priest, verse 13, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an, notice this word, everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Here's what I want you to understand. When the old covenant was given, the old covenant was meant to be to carry the children of Israel through the end of time or through the end times. And it's important for us to understand this because as New Testament or New Covenant believers, we realize we've read the rest of the story and we realize that the old covenant eventually was done away with and it was replaced with a better covenant, the new covenant that we're in today. But I want you to understand that God did not give the old covenant as a joke. It wasn't like, I'm going to give you this old covenant, <laughs> I'm really going to take it away, psych. It, God fully intended for the old covenant to be the only covenant and to carry the children of Israel through the end of time or through the end times. Now, I'm not going to preach the sermon. We talked about it before. We know that the old covenant has been done away with. We know that the old covenant's done. And you say, well, does this make God a liar because there's these different things that are supposed to be everlasting? And here's what you need to understand. Even though the Old Covenant was done away with, the requirements of the Old Covenant were fulfilled through Christ and in Christ. So all of those things, look, God, God, God's not dumb, obviously. God finds a way to keep his word even when man messes up. So, well, the, the, the Passover was supposed to be forever. Well, now it's in Christ, who's our Passover. So guess what? It's forever. Uh, well, well, there's supposed to be a priesthood. Yeah, well, there was a priesthood before the Levitical priest called Melchizedek, who the Levitical priest actually gave offerings unto, and that priesthood will continue on forever. By the way, that's the priesthood you and I happen to be in, which is why we uh, believe in the priesthood of the believer, which is why we can go to God directly in prayer. God, look, you can't outsmart God. God's got it all figured out. He's got all his ducks in a row, and he's checked off all, all the boxes. You're not going to find somewhere in the Bible where, here, God messed up. He forgot this one. No, even when the old covenant was done away with, God made sure, and God had a way of making sure that all of these everlasting promises were fulfilled. God is not a man that he should lie. So here's what you need to understand about the covenant. The old covenant was meant to carry the children of Israel through the end times or through what we call the end, you know, through the end of time or what we call the end times. 
Here's point number two. And I'd like you to go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. If you go to the, the Old Testament, excuse me, the New Testament, I'm confusing myself. Start at the book of Revelation and head back. You've got Jude, 3rd, 2nd, and 1st John, 2nd, and 1st Peter, James, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. And I realize I'm giving you a lot of information tonight. And I apologize, uh, but I, I don't know how else to do it. I just need to give you all this info. There are some things you need to know about the covenant. All right? We talked about there are some things you need to know about God. I hope you got those. Then there are some things that you need to know about the covenants. Number one, the old covenant was meant to carry the children of Israel through the end times or through the end of times. Number two, the old covenant was disannulled, meaning it was canceled, it was declared no longer valid, and replaced by a new and better covenant. I know you know that. Let's just look at a verse, Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he, that's referring to Jesus, is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So notice the new covenant, or the New Testament, is a better covenant established upon better promises. Now, let me answer some questions. You're, you're there in, in, in uh, Hebrews uh, 8, 6. Uh, just stay there for a second. Let, let me answer this, this and, I, and I want to make sure you understand this. In fact, just write this down. Here's point number three. The old covenant, the old covenant was not replaced because of a problem with the covenant. You need to understand that. The Old Testament, the old covenant, was not replaced because of a problem with the covenant, but instead because of a problem with the people keeping the covenant. You're there in Hebrews 8, look at verse 7. He says, he just got done telling us that Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, right? Look at verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. He says, if that first covenant would have had no fault, then there would have been no need for the second covenant. You say, well, that kind of makes it sound like there's a problem with the first covenant. Verse 8. For finding fault, not with the covenant, but with them. Do you see that? For finding fault with them, he saith... Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. What is that? The Mosaic covenant on Mount Sinai, the covenant he made with them, with Moses. He said, not, not according to that covenant. He says, because they, why, why? Why did he replace that covenant with a better covenant that had better promises? Here's why. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So here's what you need to understand about the covenant. The old covenant was not a fake covenant. It was not a psych covenant. The old covenant was meant to carry the children of Israel through the end times and to the end of time. The old covenant was disannulled, it was canceled, it was declared no longer valid, and replaced by a new and better covenant. But the old covenant was not replaced because of a problem with the covenant. The old covenant was replaced because of, the, because of a fault with the people keeping the covenant. Does that make sense? Have I lost you yet? <laughs> don't raise your hand. I don't need to hear that. But I need you to understand all these things. Hopefully, hopefully you've, you've got all that, and, and that's kind of the introduction, all right, the foundation. Now let me give you my theory, all right? With all that said, with all what said, that God knows the end from the beginning, God has a plan for every choice, and God knows what choice you will make. God gave a covenant that was meant to carry the people to the end of time. And that covenant ended up getting replaced, not because of a problem with the covenant, but because of a problem with the people who were supposed to keep the covenant. With all that said, let's talk about Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy. Chapters 40 through 48. What's going on here? And let me just say this. When I, when I talk about Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy chapters, I'm talking about Ezekiel 40 through 48. I realize there are other chapters that deal with end times, but that's what I'm referring to. When I say Ezekiel's Temple and Times Prophecy. Maybe you'd like to write this down. I've got six statements, all right? So I had six statements about things you need to know about God. I had three statements of things you need to know about the covenants. And I've got, excuse me, seven statements about things that you need to know about 
uh, Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy chapters, Ezekiel's 40 through 48. We'll try to get this done in like 10 minutes, all right? Number one, Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy chapters, what we read about in Ezekiel 40 through 48, describes what the end times would have been like under the Old Covenant if the Old Covenant would have continued. What we are reading about when we read Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, we are reading what the end times would have been like under the Old Covenant if the Old Covenant would have continued. Number two, Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy chapters Ezekiel 40 through 48, is like the book of Revelation for the Old Covenant. Just like we get to the end of the New Testament, and God gives us the book of Revelation, which says this is what the end will look like under this covenant, Ezekiel 40 and 48, in my opinion, is the Old Testament version of the book of Revelation. When I say Old Testament, I'm not talking about the division in your Bible. I'm talking about the Old Covenant. It is the Old Covenant version of Uh, the book of Revelation, meaning what we are reading is what end times would have looked like, what end times would have looked like if the Old Covenant would have continued. Number three, because the Old Covenant was disannulled, canceled, declared no longer valid, and replaced with a new covenant, a better covenant, built upon better promises, Ezekiel's version of the end times described in Ezekiel 40 through 48, has also been disannulled and replaced as well and will never happen. See, this temple that we're reading about in Ezekiel 40 and 48, it's not going to happen. It, it, it didn't happen with Zerubbabel. And it's definitely end times, especially as we get into chapters 46, 47, and 48 over the next three weeks. It's definitely meant to be end times literature, but this specific prophecy is not going to happen. You say, well, was there a problem with the prophecy? No, the prophecy was under a covenant, and there was no problem with the covenant, but the covenant was disannulled and replaced because of a fault in the covenant. You say, with the covenant? No, with the people who kept the covenant. So Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy describes what the end times would look like under the Old Covenant, if the Old Covenant continued. Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy is like the book of Revelation. You can think of it as the book of Revelation for the Old Covenant. And because the Old Covenant was disannulled and replaced, Ezekiel's version of end times, described in chapters 40 through 48, has been disannulled and replaced as well and will never happen. Number four, Ezekiel's version of the end times under the Old Covenant, as described in Ezekiel 40 through 48, uh, 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 of the temple and the end times, as described in chapters 40 through 48, is very similar, is very similar to the book of Revelation's end times description under the new covenant because of the fact that it's the same God orchestrating both covenants. So as we've studied Ezekiel and as we continue to study Ezekiel, we will find things that overlap. We'll find things like, for example, Ezekiel describes Gog and Magog. Revelation describes Gog and Magog. You say, well, well, what do you mean? I mean, this was a version of the end times under the old covenant. Yes, but the version of the end times under the new covenant also involves Gog and Magog, also involves King David, also involves a millennial reign, also involves all those things. You say, why? Because it's the same God. It's not two different gods with two different covenants. It's the same God. He just had one plan, and then he had to get rid of that, and he created a new plan. But the, but the second plan has a lot of overlap with the old plan. Look, as New Testament believers, we didn't just start a new thing. This came out of the old covenant. The old, New Testament came out of the old testament. Our New Testament belief is founded on Jesus Christ. The Old Covenant speaks of Jesus Christ, prophesies of Jesus Christ, gives all these descriptions of Jesus Christ. Number five, because you're thinking to yourself, then why in the world have we just spent the last several weeks studying the book of Ezekiel in, in these last chapters? Number five, studying Ezekiel's temple and the end times prophecy chapters 40 through 48 is no different than studying the book of Leviticus or any other passage dealing with the Old Covenant. I mean, we spent a long time going chapter by chapter through the book of Leviticus, did we not? 
And remember, when we started Leviticus and all through Leviticus, I kept telling you, this doesn't apply to us. This is written to an old covenant, a different covenant. We're in the New Testament. You say, why do we study it? Because you can still, because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all Scripture is profitable. And because of the fact that you can still learn from it, you can still glean truths from it, you can still learn about God from it, you can still get symbolism from it. So when you're studying Ezekiel 40 through 48, you should consider it like if you're studying the book of Leviticus. It's a different covenant. It doesn't apply to us. We're not going to go and perform these sacrifices. We're not going to go and do these things. But we can still learn about God and what God thought or felt in regards to these things. Number six, and let me just kind of help you with this. The main parts, and of course, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Only, you know, those things which are revealed belong unto us. The book of Revelation belongs unto us. Those things have been revealed. There's other things that we don't know for sure. We see through a glass darkly. God's going to have to fill us in when we get to heaven. But let me just help you. The main parts about Ezekiel's temple and the end times prophecy chapters, Ezekiel 40 through 48, that will not happen is what was changed from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. The sacrifices, the priesthood, the holy days, the Sabbath. There's no different thinking here. The same things, the same way that we look at the New Testament and say, hey, the Old Testament still applies, except for these specific things that were done away with, that were done away when the law was changed, when the priesthood was changed, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. We just need to realize that Ezekiel is prophesying of end times under an Old Covenant, and after Ezekiel... That old covenant was changed. That old covenant was changed. And now we just need to realize that everything that was changed under that old covenant, we say, well, in Leviticus, that no longer applies. Well, in Ezekiel, that doesn't apply either. So there's no sacrifices in the millennial reign. There's no burnt sacrifices. None of those things are going to happen in the millennial reign. The book of Hebrews is extremely clear on that. Are you there in Hebrews? Look at, look at Hebrews 7. I just want you to notice this verse again. We saw it. Recently, but I'd like you to see it. Hebrews 7, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. When the priesthood was changed and done away with, it was necessary to make a change to the law. Now, people say, God got rid of the law. That's not what this verse says. It doesn't say that God got rid of the law. It says that God made a change to the law. Well, what did God change? Well, he's talking about the fact that he had to change the thing because the priesthood was changed. So everything that has to do with the priesthood, the Sabbaths, the washings, the sacrifices, those things have been done away. So if you're reading Ezekiel 40 through 48 and you're wondering and you're thinking to yourself, I wonder what of this is going to uh, not apply in the New Testament version of the end times. Uh, anything that has to do with the priesthood doesn't apply anymore. It's been changed. Go to uh, Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6. I want to share this passage with you. This is actually a passage that Pastor McMurtry emailed me a couple of days ago. Zechariah chapter 6, if, if you start at the end of the book uh, of the Old Testament, Malachi, and then you head back, you got Zechariah chapter 6. You say, okay, I think I get it. God doesn't make choices for us. He gives us choices, and those choices have consequences. God knows what will happen at the end of every choice that we make, and God also knows what choice we will make. That doesn't mean that God made the choice on our behalf, but it just means that God knows. He's all-knowing, and he knows what will happen. And I understand that there was an old covenant. There's nothing wrong with that old covenant. That old covenant was meant to take the children of Israel to the end of time or to what we call the end times. But that old covenant was disannulled and replaced because not of a fault within the covenant, but because of a fault with the people who were keeping the covenant. And I understand that Ezekiel was prophesying within that old covenant, and he was prophesying what would happen in the end times if that old covenant continued. But here's a question that somebody might ask. They might say, well, if Ezekiel was going to prophesy in the end times, and God knew that the old covenant was going to be done away with, why didn't Ezekiel just give us a prophecy like the book of Revelation, with no sacrifices, with no temple? What's the point of that? Why would he give us that? If God knew, hey, he's prophesying about something that very much has the potential of happening based on your decisions and your choices. This could be what the end times looks like based on your choices, but God knew that wasn't going to happen. Why would God even give that to us? Why would he put it in the canon of Scripture? Why would he give us all these chapters to let us know about a future that could happen under the old covenant that's not going to happen? You say, what's the point 
of that. And the answer to that question is this, God's grace. You say, what do you mean? Number seven, the purpose of Ezekiel giving us, Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy chapters, chapter 40 through 48. Because remember, Ezekiel is prophesying in the old covenant. It has not yet been done away with. In fact, it's going to be a long time before it's done away with. The children of Israel still have to come back into the promised land. Ezra is going to begin to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah is going to begin to rebuild the walls. Zerubbabel is going to finish that wall. We're going to, we're going to have all that. You know, we're, we're still, look, after Ezekiel, there's still a lot of Old Testament Bible left. You've got all those stories about Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Esther. You've got all those great stories. There's a 400 silent, years of silence between the Old and the New Testament. And then you've got John the Baptist show up on the scene. There's a lot of time that is still left when Ezekiel is prophesying within the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. You say, well, what is the purpose? Here's the purpose. The purpose of Ezekiel giving us Ezekiel's temple and end times prophecy Ezekiel's 40 and 48, is as one last attempt to get the people to get right with God. You say, what do you mean? By explaining to them that God has a plan for them. And by explaining to them what you are walking away from when you choose to walk away from God and what you will miss out on. See, God gave Ezekiel this prophecy because of God's grace. Because God was not giving the children of Israel a psych, covenant, gotcha, I was just kidding. The New Testament was too short, so I had to write more. He actually wanted the covenant to work, and he wanted to, to work with those people. And Ezekiel is prophesying within that covenant and telling the people, this is what God has planned for you. This is what God wants for you. This is God's will for you. Don't walk away from it. Zechariah 6, verse 12. Let me prove it to you. And spake unto him, saying, this is again, Zechariah, giving us an end times prophecy from the old covenant. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. And you can study this out on your own. I'll just give you the answer. That's Jesus. And he, Jesus, shall grow up out of his place. And he, Jesus shall build the temple of the Lord, and he, Jesus, shall build the temple of the Lord, and he, Jesus, shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both, and the crown shall be to Helam, and to Tobijah, and to Jediah, and to Han, and to Zephaniah, for a memorial. Notice the emphasis, in the temple of the Lord, and they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And he shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. This is Zechariah preaching within the old covenant of an end times, just like Ezekiel, and end times, what the end times would look like in the old covenant. But notice what Zechariah says at the end of verse 15. And this shall come to pass if, you see that? If ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. I want you to notice that this covenant, not the Abrahamic covenant. One day I need, I need to do a sermon. I, I need to do a sermon where I just go through and explain the different covenants. Not the Abrahamic covenant and not the Davidic covenant. Those were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But that Mosaic covenant that was given on Mount Sinai, that was a conditional covenant. God says, if you do this, I will do this. If you do that, I will do that. And even here in end times, God says, hey, I'm going to raise up this branch. He's going to build you a temple. He's going to do all these great things. And, it, and this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. And there's a big condition and there's a big disclaimer that this will only happen as a result of the decisions and the choices that you make. Go back to Ezekiel 43. We're, we're, we're done. Ezekiel 43, look at verse 9. God explains this in Ezekiel as well. I just wanted to show it to you. Ezekiel 43, verse 9. Ezekiel 43, 9, the Bible says this, Now let them put away their whoredoms. This is Ezekiel speaking to the children of Israel. 
He's prophesying about this great time where they're going to have all this land and they're going to have this temple and they're going to have this and they're going to have that. And God wants to bless them and God wants to do all these things for them. And this is what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 43 and verse 9. He says, now let them put away their whoredoms. This was actually given to me by uh, Brother Nate, since I'm giving everybody credit, you know, everybody that helped me with this sermon. Ezekiel 43, verse 9. Now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Thou son of man, notice what God is telling Ezekiel. Thou son of man, here's the purpose of Ezekiel 40 through 48. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel. You say, why do we have all these chapters where God is telling us, and the windows were this big, and the doors were this big, and the entryway was this big, and the court was like this, and the court was like that? Why do we have all that? Here's why. Because God told Ezekiel in verse 10, Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel. He said, show the temple. Show this temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. And let them measure the pattern. Notice verse 11. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and all the laws thereof and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. Why? Because Ezekiel was given this as a last effort to say, this is what God has planned for you, and this is what you will miss out on if you don't keep the covenant. And they had a choice. They had a choice. Do we keep the covenant, or do we not keep the covenant? And God already knew how either choice would play out. If they kept the covenant, it would play out like the book of Revelation. If they did not keep the covenant, it would play out like Ezekiel 40 through 48. God knew what choices they could make, God knew how those choices would play out, and God also knew what choice they would make, which is why you and I are here today under this covenant, in this testament, as New Testament believers. Let me just real quickly just review this real quick for you, and we'll be done. Things you need to know about this Ezekiel's Temple End Times Prophecy, Ezekiel's Temple End Times Prophecy, chapters 40 through 48, describe what the end times would have been like under the Old Covenant if the Old Covenant would have continued. Ezekiel's end times prophecy and temple chapters is like the book of Revelation for the Old Covenant. Number three, because the Old Covenant was disannulled and replaced, Ezekiel's version of the end times described in chapters 40 through 48 has also been disannulled and replaced and will never happen. Number four, Ezekiel's version of the end times under the Old Covenant as described in Ezekiel's temple and end times uh, prophecy chapters 40 through 48 is very similar to the book of Revelation's end times description under the New Covenant because it is the same God in both covenants. Number five, studying Ezekiel's uh, end times chapters 40 through 48 is no different than studying the book of Leviticus or any passage dealing with the Old Covenant. It doesn't apply to us specifically, but we can still learn from it.